This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Gnosis, an open platform for businesses to create their own prediction market applications on top of the Ethereum network. They recently launched Gnosis X, a challenge inviting developers to build apps on top of the Gnosis platform. To learn more, go to epicenter.tv slash Gnosis X. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastien Couture, and today we're here to talk about um, the Republic Protocol and dark pools. And so to talk about this, I have with me as uh, our guests, Taiyang Zhang and Lung Wang, uh, who are respectively the CEO and CTO of the Republic Protocol. And so the Republic Protocol is uh, a new protocol that is a decentralized dark pool. And so a dark pool is is an exchange platform, is, is a platform where traders uh, will come on board and uh, essentially trade large amounts of, of, of assets um, in a way that is obfusc obfuscated from the rest of the market. So uh, traditionally, dark pools were uh, in, in sort of traditional finance, financial markets called uh, upstairs trading. Uh, but uh, dark pools still exist today in traditional markets as well as in crypto. And so the Republic Protocol allows for um, a decentralized and trustless uh, dark pool uh, in a way that high net worth individuals uh, and traders can um, execute large trades for pairs like Bitcoin, um, Ether, and ERC-20 tokens. So uh, very excited to have you on, guys. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for inviting us, Seb. Yeah, thanks for inviting us. Happy to be here. Great. So uh, before we get started, uh, let's talk a little bit about your respective backgrounds. So perhaps starting uh, with Taiyang, uh, please tell us how you got in involved in the space and what led you uh, to uh, um, starting this new company and building the Republic Protocol. Yeah, sure. So um, perhaps it's best to start where I guess the, the power of distributed systems first came in for me. Um, so I started out as a programmer probably around my teenage years um, and got quite heavily as many people do into um, like that sort of hacking systems and distributed denial of service systems. So I think that that was the first time that you sort of realized that distributed systems are actually very powerful. Um, and, and then so I went to the Australian National University, which is um, where I met Long and and also, we we worked together previously uh, at a startup um, doing big data for health. And more recently, we founded New Code, which was a software development agency. So we did a lot of uh, work all around the place. So uh, for different clients, uh, sort of government agencies, logistics, geospatial, uh, etc. Um, so more recently, I I got into the cryptocurrency space because one of my friends um, asked me to write the, I guess, the trading algorithms and architecture behind a fund called Virgil Capital, which I co-founded. Um, so, so that was early last year, and uh, the fund is still running. It's doing very well. So primarily arbitrage strategies. Um, but, but the way I really got deep into crypto was um, we were trading Bitcoin and it, with a fully hedged strategy, and it, it was very... Um, it was very lucrative, of course, because Bitcoin is quite quite a volatile beast. Um, and, and then we started looking into ETH and 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 I guess the whole Ethereum platform, and and really started getting into smart contracts and and looking at the power of what you could really build in a sort of decentralized application or protocol. And I, I think that there are many new sort of governance structures and exciting applications that can be built. So so that's where um, I really started. Yeah, um, distributed systems for me has always uh, been a big passion of mine. Uh, so when I went to the Australian National University uh, and I first started learning about concurrency, um, I kind of came into it with the mindset that I think a lot of people do, which is that it's just a way to make your computers go faster by doing more at once. Um, and the more I got into it, the more I learned that it's a completely different uh, world. Uh, and I guess my passions in that area were always uh, going to lead me uh, to blockchain, um, as these things are probably the biggest uh, and most interesting decentralized systems that we have. Um, 
I did a lot of research at Australian National University around these kind of systems. Uh, so while I was doing research as a student, I uh, through the ANU I collaborated with Cray, who's a, a supercomputing company, and helped them with their uh, supercomputing language chapel. And then I went on to do my honours thesis in the same area and built my own language, which specialised in systems that were only concurrent, and only uh, distributed, and had no notion of doing things in order. Um, and yeah, I'd worked together with Ty for several years at Newcode, and so when he came to me with the idea of working in uh, blockchain space and the decentralized space, um, there was no way I was going to turn that up. So Tyang, you mentioned that you were doing some trading previously uh, when you founded Virgil Capital. Can you talk about what uh, that experience? You're working in a in a in a, in a quant trading firm. Um, uh, how did that experience play into you know your idea for Republic? Well, well I think that um, I mean, as you trade on multiple exchanges, uh, you, you start to realize that although these exchanges process you know billions of dollars of liquidity every day cumulatively, um, there there is a lack for lack of um, lack of avenues for OTC trades. I mean, so there are particular strategies that you can run on sort of lit exchanges, which are essentially exchanges where the order book is um, visible. And, and there are just some sort of trades that you don't want to place there. So I think that um, e even though there are ways for you to execute, um, I, I guess, trades without with minimal market impact on uh, traditional sort of exchanges in, in crypto, uh, if you can call them that, um, the, the market impact is still quite great. So I mean, that's where the need for the dark pool really comes in. When when you say market impact, so could you describe so when you're when you're a large trader, when you're trading, say uh, I don't know, you want to make a trade for like four hundred million dollars in Bitcoin. Uh, what are the types of things that you have to watch out for? Like how how does that trade play out? You know, if you're using a, a traditional market, um, or maybe you have a strategy where you're you're executing some of that trade on on an open market and some of that trade on a uh, through through an OTC. Can, can you describe sort of as as a trader uh, or or a hedge fund, like how would you go about doing something like that without a dark pool? I mean, uh, unless your intentions are to manipulate the markets, which is highly illegal, um, the the most important thing is to have the best um, price for your order. So, I mean, you always want to want the best price. If you're selling Bitcoin, for example, you want the highest price um, possible. So, I mean, this is where you might be able to source from different avenues and, and many different exchanges for liquidity. And that's probably the single most important thing for um, many of these algo uh, hedge funds or quant funds. So, so I think that's that's the primary um, reason why you would want to source liquidity from a dark pool like this. Um, initially, we do expect that uh, a lot of the guys who will be using um, a dark pool like ours would be your your big OTC players in this space. Um, so, so guys like you know. Um, like Genesis, Cumberland Mining, and uh, Circle, and a couple of other guys like that, they they all um, need more liquidity to source from. So, I mean, this is where we really play in. Let's just take a step back here and, and perhaps talk about the, the, the phenomenon of a, of a dark pool uh, in, in traditional markets. I mean, this is nothing new. It, it's, it's not necessarily... Uh, unique to the crypto space. So dark pools exist in, in, uh, in, the in traditional financial markets. In fact, most large banks um, have uh, um, dark pool markets or markets that are not uh, open to the public. Uh, can, can you give us a bit of a background on that? And you know, what, what, how, much, how much do these uh, markets represent in terms of liquidity? Yeah, so dark pools have been around for perhaps 30, 35 years or so, uh, roughly speaking. Uh, a lot of exchanges, a lot of broker dealers, they, they own dark pools. So, for example, um, there, there are a couple of large independent dark pools like ChaiX, LiquidNet, and Instanet. And then you have the more broker dealer owned dark pools like JP Morgan, Deutsche, Fidelity, um, et cetera. And, and even the New York Stock Exchange or the ASX, um, the Australian Stock Exchange, they all have their own dark pools. So, so there are many people tackling this space on a traditional uh, equities, Forex um, sort of space. Um, and you're typically looking at, uh, I mean, the estimates sort of vary, but um, you're looking at roughly 15% of equities volumes being traded on dark pools. I mean, the number differs between US and European 
markets. Okay, so 15% of training volumes uh, go through dark pools. Can you, can you give us an idea of like how important are dark pools to the overhaul, the overall economic wealth of a market? Because like when you, when you think of it, uh, I mean, through doing this research, I mean, I, I wasn't super familiar with the concept of, dark, of a dark pool, but it, it kind of makes sense. I mean, if you're a high net worth individual and you, you're looking to make these trades and not necessarily, you know, uh, uh, mani manipulate the market, uh, it, it would be ideal to have some sort of a, a, a liquidity pool uh, where, you know, you're you're not going to sort of... Uh, uh, manipulate the market in a way that your, your own trades potentially be less advantageous. Um, but if you look at it from the other side, sort of from a like free market perspective, you know, some would criticize dark pools as being uh, antithetical to the views of a, of a, of an open and transparent and free market. Um, can you give us some sense about of like how important is a dark pool to the, the overall uh, economic health uh, of a market? Well, I, I like to think of it as, you know, dark pools were created out of a, a need. Um, and, and that need is really that you know, I have a large volume um, order and I, and I want to trade it in the best possible way, right? So, I mean, I mean, this is where the the need comes from. And, and coming to the point on sort of transparency and, and the need for open markets, I, I think that dark, I, I, would, I would like to frame it in a way that, you know, the the, the issue that most regulators have are, are surrounding the, um, the dark pools rules and, and the way that people are you know, trading on the exchange. So for example, um, I, I won't quote any exact incidents, but there have been many large banks or institutions who have uh, in the past sort of given priority liquidity to customers who pay more. And that's something that's sort of seen as not fair in the markets. So, so I think that if we're developing fair and provable markets, um, the, the rule set, that everybody is trading on must not change. And you should not be able to bribe your way into the system, um, so to say. So, I, I mean, this is where I think a, a decentralized dark pool is very important um, because the, the rule set on where everybody is trading is very uh, transparent and it's it's the same for everyone. And it's provably fair, so. Dialing back now and coming down to, to the crypto level and the crypto markets, um, you mentioned that 15% of liquidity on traditional markets go th goes through dark pools. Do you have any idea, uh, do we have any uh, estimates of uh, how much liquidity goes through dark pools on crypto markets? Uh, I think the difference is because um, I guess reporting is not necessarily mandatory in crypto markets. It, it's very hard to see the exact amount that's going through dark pools. Um, and, and so, I mean, the, the estimates that we've been looking at have been uh, directly derived from uh, traditional equity markets. So I, I think that uh, crypto trading has the potential to do the same, if not more, in the short term, um, purely because of the size of the market. So, I mean, we're still at a very nascent stage and um, a, a relatively small market cap for, you know, the, the entire entirety of cryptocurrencies. Um, so, so I think that, uh, which means that large trades uh, are more impactful than ever on public markets. Um, so, so I, I think the estimate of 15% is quite reasonable, but um, uh, again, it's all just sort of a guess at this stage. And where do these trades occur? So we, we, we mentioned that uh, in, in traditional markets, you know, uh, broker dealer houses and, and, and banks have their, their own dark pools that they operate, they're, they're regulated, they're, uh, they're a product offering that you know, as a high net worth individual or fund I can have access to. Um, in the crypto space, though, you know, most people would just you know, find some exchange and, and do their trades there. Um, you know, but if if I'm a if I'm a miner or, or a large exchange and I need to access uh, high amounts of liquidity, where where do I turn to? So where where can I execute a a, a high value, a high liquidity uh, trade uh, in the crypto space today? Yeah. So I mean, just coming back to the point on the $400 million trade, which we saw published, I think it was probably two months ago. Um, that was from uh, for a purchase of Bitcoin. Um, so these trades are typically happening face-to-face um, -face or over the phone, over Skype. I mean, the, the, these are sort of um, the, the avenues that people are choosing to trade right now. Um, of course, you know, you have your large OTC desks, which um, the majority of people are currently going to. But I think these are the two primary avenues on which these trades are happening right now. You know, if I'm doing these trades over the phone, 
where where am I discovering the other side of this trade? Uh, are there the sort of platforms, or centralized uh, platforms, where I can discover um, you know people trading? Yeah, so uh, a, a lot of it is, it is happening word, through word of mouth. Um, so people are just connecting people together. Um, as far as the OTC desks go, I mean, the, these are entities that you can just go to and they will help you source liquidity. So, I mean, they might have an algo, um, algo on the other side sourcing liquidity from public markets, or they know, you know a couple of other people looking to buy or sell uh, huge quantities of crypto assets. Okay, so there, there seems to be a, a need then for uh, for something like Republic, because uh, I, I, I would I would assume that you know discovering uh, discovering uh, uh, another side of a trade uh, through word of mouth is not necessarily the most efficient way of going about it. Yeah, it, it's not the most efficient, but I think that it will it will definitely exist for a long time. All right, so then let's let's dive into to the Republic protocol. So this is a this is a new protocol that that you're launching. Um, you know, explain then. So, what, at a high level, what are the different components of this protocol? Yeah. So, looking looking at the protocol um, and, and the different components, the the most important thing for us is, you know, it, it's quite counterintuitive to develop a decentralized dark pool where the order book is hidden, yet everybody still owns it, and you're still able to match orders and settle them in a way that's anonymous until execution. So, uh, th there are various components of the, the protocol. Um, so we we have, you know, the the settlement layer, um, which is on, on the relevant chain, so uh, BTC ETH, and that layer is currently an atomic swap. Um, we are looking at other solutions, but right now that's the most stable one. Um, and, and then we also have in the system we have um, uh, an order book which is propagated through a peer to peer network, so it's not a blockchain, um, purely because we don't require consensus for it, and it would be inefficient. If we were to create a blockchain for that, um, so so yeah, those are the primary components. So a hidden order book, and then um, we have people who match orders. So these nodes match orders, and then they're settled. So so those are all the components. There's an atomic swap mechanism that essentially allows two parties to settle a transaction peer to peer. Uh, so we'll talk a bit about more about that later uh, in the discussion. Uh, a decentralized order matching. Uh, system, uh, which allows two two parties or or more parties, and we'll we'll get deeper into that. But you know, multiple parties to uh, match orders without knowing necessarily the underlying details of the larger uh, order, uh, and a decentralized order book where the orders are hidden. Um, why is it important for the orders to be hidden? So it's important for the orders to be hidden because. Um, Let's just say say that I do want to trade um, legitimately a, a huge amount of um, crypto assets. So so we saw last year, I, I think it was around the April May period in which um, GDAX had a flash crash. Um, it, it was just a very large order that you know triggered the market and, and um, triggered a lot of margin calls essentially. And, and then the, the price of ETH just sort of crashed down to a, a very low point. I can't remember the exact amount. Um, so, so it's really. Um, uh, I think that that's that. I mean, that's the primary reason. So, walk us through then uh, a trade. Uh, let let's let's imagine that uh, all all three of us are involved in the trade. So, uh, Taiyang, you know, you're a high net worth individual, and you've got four hundred million dollars of Bitcoin that you want to sell for Ether. And on the other side of that trade, there's myself and uh, and Lung. And let's say I have a hundred million dollars in ether, and Lung has three hundred million, uh, and we're we're participating in the in, in the Republic Protocol um, as um, as traders. Uh, so, could you walk us through then that trade? How does that play out for all of us? Yeah. So, uh, what happens is that each of us has to take our order, and we follow the Republic Protocol encoding of that order, and we break it up into a bunch of fragments. Now these fragments aren't smaller orders. Uh, they're information theoretic secure uh, cryptographic encodings of this order, and you need a large number of them uh, to get together to rediscover what the original order actually was. And so Ty would take his four hundred million dollar order, and he would split it up into these fragments, and he'd submit one fragment to each node in the network. 
or some subset of nodes. And you and I would do the same for our orders. Now these dark nodes would engage in the order matching game where they take these fragments and they compare them locally without sharing them. And when they've reached the end of the computation, they eventually do get together and share them and they reveal a, a Boolean, true or false, that says, yes, uh, there's a match here, or no, there is not a match here. Uh, at that point, we can observe that match, and the network is expecting us to execute on that. Um, and we deploy our atomic swapping contracts to uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin, respectively. And then we observe the deployments of these contracts, make sure that everything is as we expect. And if not, the network is able to inspect them and see which one of us is actually acting maliciously. Um, and then, assuming that everything's going fine, we execute the atomic swap, uh, tie with myself and, and tie with yourself. From a user experience perspective, um, just so I get an idea, we get an idea here of how how long this trade would occur. Let's say that uh, you know uh, Tang uh, puts up his 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 order for four hundred million in Bitcoin, and the liquidity, the ether, the ether liquidity is there to match that order, right? Let's assume that the liquidity is there instantly. Uh, how long will this would it take for this trade to occur uh, once it's been sent to the So network. this actually depends on how many pending orders there are in the system. Uh, because the dark nodes have no information about the order or very little information about the order, they really have no choice but to do a brute force computation where they check every possible uh, comparison. Um, assuming the liquidity is there and assuming that you're handling a couple hundred orders per second, um, which is how much we expect the network to be able to handle, then you would expect to see a match within a couple seconds. And the atomic swap itself will settle in how long? Uh, well, that's dependent on the underlying blockchain. Uh, so at the moment, we're picking atomic swaps because they're the most stable and sort of tried and tested solution. Um, they take a couple minutes uh, if you're trading Bitcoin to Ethereum. Uh, but they can take up to 24 hours if both parties aren't cooperating heavily. And so this is why we're sort of exploring other, other avenues as well. Okay, so let, let's come back to this example and maybe break it down a little bit. So when, when Tang puts up his order, his order for, for 400 million, you said that he breaks it up into fragments. Uh, can you explain what you mean by that exactly? What are these fragments and what do they represent uh, with regards to the order itself? So it all comes down to this idea of being able to build lines from points. So. If I want to have a, a secret number, and I don't want anyone to know what it is, but I want a bunch of people to be able to get together and know what it is, I can take that uh, number and put it on the y-intercept of, of a two-dimensional graph. Now, if I want two people to be able to discover this order, I can create a line that goes through that y-intercept. Now, if you had two points, you would be able to reconstruct that line perfectly, and you'd be able to see exactly where on the y-intercept it touches, and then you'd be able to see my secret. But with only one point on that line, you have no chance of knowing exactly what it looks like and where my secret actually is. And it turns out that this property holds for arbitrary dimension polynomials. So if I want three people to have to get together to discover my line, I create a polynomial of degree two. And if I want four people to get together, I create a polynomial of degree three, and so on and so on. So you construct a network that has a large number of nodes in it, and you take your order, or parts of your order, and you encode them as numbers and you put them on the y-intercept of a polynomial. And then you take points on that polynomial and you give a different point to each uh, node. And these sets of points that make up an order are what we call a fragment. Okay, so this is the, this is the concept of the... Um, of this the, is Shamir uh, secret sharing. Sh Shamir secret sharing. Okay, so for non-engineers, non-mathematicians, uh, <laughs> uh, such as myself, um, just to sort of... Uh, give a, a, an analogy to this. You're, you're giving the analogy of, uh, of, a, of a graph on an x and y axis. And so I can have a point on this graph. Um, with, with only one point, I, I cannot determine the trajectory of, of a line on this graph. Um, so, however, with two points, I can determine the trajectory of this line. So what you're doing is you're taking this line and breaking it up into several points and sharing that information about the, the individual points with nodes um, who, unless they collude, and we'll get back to the incentive model, the incentive model a bit later, 
but unless they collude, won't be able to reconstruct uh, the 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 entire the the entirety of the information that, that makes up this line. That's correct. Okay. And so once this order has been broken up into fragments, it is sent to uh, nodes uh, on the network. So could you explain uh, who are these nodes and what, what, what kind of software they're running and what is their role, I guess, in the, in the system? Sure. So these uh, nodes can be run by any member of the community as long as that member of the community has taken a, uh, an amount of REN, which we call the bond, and they've registered that on Ethereum and they've submitted that, which is essentially a good behavior bond, um, and that ties into the incentive model. Um, it's also a way to um, bound adversaries. We assume that no adversary has an unlimited amount of money, uh, so they wouldn't be able to register some huge number of nodes um, if there's a financial requirement to do so. And so um, these nodes, the software that they're running is uh, any implementation of the Republic Protocol. Uh, we provide a reference implementation in Go, uh, and we'll be providing rep uh, reference implementations in other languages. And these are open source and available in our GitHub for anyone to go and check out. Um, and the way that they work is that they take these points that they were given. And one of the interesting properties of polynomials when they're used in this way is that you can perform computations on just the points that you have. And then when you get together and reconstruct the resulting polynomial from the new points after they've been computed on, the result has the same computation, but applied to the secret. So I can construct a computation that essentially asks the question, uh, do these two orders match? And instead of asking that question on the orders, I ask them on the points that I've been given that uh, make up my fragment of that order. And then once I ask that question, and I have this uh, result, which is actually meaningless. It represents a new point on a polynomial. I get together with all of the other dark nodes. We reconstruct this line. And we look at the ultimate answer, which will say yes or no. The actual underlying orders did or did not match. And so the, these nodes participate in, in a network that uh, is, is not part of the Ethereum network. It's, it's another uh, independent network uh, of, the, of the Ethereum chain. Uh, but it's not a blockchain, correct? Yeah, that's correct. OK, so it's a, it's a, it's a DHT, um, right? Yep, that's correct. So it's okay. a peer-to-peer -peer network. Yeah. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer network where there is information sharing between the nodes. Um, why not? Why not build this on a? Um, why did you choose to build this as a DHT and not like a, a Tenement blockchain or some other distributed ledger tech uh, in particular? The major problem with blockchains that a lot of um, blockchains are facing at the moment is the publicity of information. So. The whole point of these fragments is that you don't want them to be shared publicly because if you had enough of them, you could get together and, and reveal the secret. Uh, if you were to post these uh, fragments to the blockchain, you'd have a lot of issues because everyone could see them. Uh, and if you posted them to the blockchain in an encrypted form, then the computation that you have to do on these fragments to get some, some result out is incredibly computationally expensive. It would have a lot of associated fees. Um, it may not even fit into a single block. Uh, and even if you're doing a simple kind of transaction on Ethereum, it can take several minutes before that computation is actually confirmed. Um, whereas we can do it off-chain in a couple of seconds because we don't have to have reached this sort of consensus that every single node has all of the same information. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis is an open platform for businesses to create their own prediction markets on the Ethereum network. Prediction markets are powerful tools for aggregating information about the expected outcome of future events. So this can be used for things like information gathering, incentivizing behaviors, making governance decisions, or even creating insurance products. So in order to turn Gnosis into the most powerful forecasting tool in the world, they recently launched Gnosis X. It's a challenge that invites developers to build applications on top of the platform. And the best applications per category will be rewarded up to $100,000 in GNO tokens. So throughout the year, Gnosis will announce different categories for the challenge. And the current challenge has categories for science and R&D, token diligence, and blockchain project integration. Gnosis also provides the SDK, which allows you to easily get started with everything you need to get coding. And they also provide dedicated support channels throughout the challenge for teams and solo builders. Are you up for the challenge? Get started now. To learn more and to sign up, go to epicenter.tv slash gnosisx. We'd like to thank Gnosis for their support of Epicenter.
Okay, then describe maybe the dynamics then between because uh, uh, Republic is built as a uh, as an Ethereum smart contract, and from what I've read, uh, uh, Republic could also be deployed as a smart contract on another blockchain. Just you've chosen Ethereum because it's the one that has sort of the most, um, you know, sec like the, the the most secure uh, security model and sort of easiest deployment uh, options available at, at the moment. It's the most mature smart contract blockchain, I guess, if we could put it that way. Um, so, the, but describe so then the the dynamic between this uh, this GHT network that sort of sits off chain, where computations are executed by individual nodes, and the Ethereum smart contract uh, that I guess executes the trades is is that a good way to put it? Yeah. Uh, so there's actually a very minimal amount of uh, interaction. The only interaction that there really is is that the dark nodes, when they want to join the network, they have to register their REN bond, and they have to do that on chain. And that registration becomes public, um, because it's on the Ethereum blockchain, to all the other nodes. So the nodes kind of passively, uh, passively observe the Ethereum blockchain, and they get to see who else is registered. And this prevents uh, a potentially malicious node from coming along and saying, hey, uh, I'm a dark node, I'd like to participate in this computation. And you could verify whether or not that was true by observing the information uh, that they were meant to put onto the Ethereum blockchain. And you could verify that their bond was in fact there, uh, that the signature that they're meant to be producing is the signature that they are producing. Um, but the actual distribution of orders, that happens uh, completely off-chain. And the computation happens completely off-chain. And the only time it comes back on-chain is when the order executed and the fees are taken. So as a, as a trader, uh, participating in the network and executing trades on the network. Am I interacting with this DSG network or am I interacting with Ethereum? It seems like the Ethereum network is only used for the bonding mechanism that serves it's as a, the incentive. It's a little bit mechanism. of both. Um, so initially you interact with the uh, Republic Protocol network that's off-chain. And once you discover a match, you go ahead and you execute the atomic swap on-chain. Right. So I execute the atomic swap on-chain, but say I'm... Say if I'm if I'm selling Bitcoin, uh, I'm not interacting with Ethereum. I, I'm not interacting with the Ethereum smart contract. I'm That's interacting right. You, with you interact with whatever uh, smart contract uh, you need. Uh, sorry, whatever contract you need to on the relevant blockchain to execute uh, the trade. So if, if it's Bitcoin to Ether, one of you will be on Bitcoin and one of you will be on Ether. Okay. So just to summarize, then, so there are the the, the dark nodes that um, that make up this the Republic Protocol network. Um, and I think in some of your documentation, you, you call this network the ocean? Yep, the dark ocean. The dark ocean, okay. And there are there is the, the Ethereum smart contract that serves as the uh, bonding mechanism where the REN tokens are bonded by the, um, the nodes uh, that are executing the computations on the trades. And then there are the individual blockchains themselves, so it could be... Ethereum, uh, it could be uh, Bitcoin, where the traders are interacting with that blockchain once the uh, order has been uh, executed, once the trade has been executed and confirmed, then I post my trade to my relevant blockchain, whichever one I'm interacting with, could be Bitcoin, Ether, or whatever, whatever other blockchain you support, and I execute the atomic swap on that blockchain. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, interesting. So as a trader, then I don't necessarily interact with the, I guess I, I only interact with the uh, with the dark ocean uh, when I'm posting my trade, presumably using uh, a client uh, or, or an app or something like that that is connected to the DHG network. Yeah, that's right. So each of the nodes in the uh, network provides an API that you can interact with. Um, and this is because the majority of uh, traders and OTC desks aren't a guy sitting at a computer um, interacting with a user interface. Um, they're doing some kind of algorithmic trading. Um, but there is going to be the Republic Terminal, which will be a decentralized uh, app, which um, high network individuals who don't have that kind of trading approach uh, can interact with a, a visual interface. So in, in your documentation, you also talk about pools. So there are nodes, individual nodes, and you have pools of nodes, and pools can also, uh, sort of nodes can group up into pools, and then pools constitute the ocean. What's the role of a pool? So um, that idea of saying that uh, we have because the nodes don't know anything about the orders, they can't um, filter this down in any way and uh, do anything but a brute force computation. 
So by breaking the nodes down into pools, we can parallelize the processing of, of the order book. So instead of every node just crunching through computations one at a time, you can have multiple pools and each of them are processing a separate part uh, and you gain performance through parallelization. Um, the other significant aspect of that is that the secure multi-party computations that these nodes do are not actually that cheap to do. They're quite expensive uh, in terms of computational time. And the larger the group of nodes that are participating in one of these uh, secure multi-party computations, uh, the longer it takes. And so by breaking them down into randomly sampled pools, you can maintain similar security uh, thresholds, but massively increase your performance. So what, what kind of computations are we talking about here? Does one require special hardware or to, to, to perform these computations? These computations, are, what actually slows them down is the network uh, communication that happens. So when you have a large number of nodes participating in one of these computations, there's a, a big strain on the network where every single node has to communicate with every other single node. Uh, obviously, the fewer nodes there are, the less communication is happening and the faster this happens. Uh, compared to that, the computational requirements of secure multi-party computations are not actually that high. So GPUs and those kinds of mining equipment might give you some computational edge, but not, not a huge one. Okay, so just, just about anybody then can participate in, with a CPU, you know, can participate yeah. in the That's right. Republic. Um, all, of, all of our testing operates on sort of your basic uh, everyday laptop, uh, four CPUs, 16 gigs of RAM. I mean, maybe not an everyday laptop, but certainly a consumer available laptop. Um, and we provide uh, our reference implementation packaged up into uh, cloud-friendly images so that you can uh, quickly deploy a dark node to the AWS cloud. Um, and of course, to err away from the side of centralization, we'll be providing images for varying uh, platforms, cloud platforms. Interesting. So let's talk about the security model a little bit and the incentive mechanisms that secures the network. So uh, one, of the, one of the premises of, of Republic is to have um, a, a private order book. And the, the whole point here, as we discussed earlier, is so that you know, uh, this, this, uh, this dark pool and the trades happening on this dark pool don't you know, disrupt uh, the, the price of the, underlying, of the assets on, on the public networks. Are on the public um, uh, exchanges and, and, and public markets. And so, you know, I might have an incentive, one might have an incentive to disclose the information that is within uh, the, dark, uh, the dark pool, within the Republic protocol on an open platform. So, you know, if I'm a malicious actor, I may have an incentive to um, take the information that I am retrieving as a node and post it, so the information about trades, and, and post that on an open forum. Um, talk about the incentive mechanisms that prevent this sort of behavior and the, the sort of uh, attack vectors that Republic Protocol can mitigate against. Sure. So there's two sorts of adversarial models to consider here. One is um, the non-adaptive adversary, and the other is the adaptive adversary. So in the non-adaptive adversary case, you're assuming you've got one a uh, person or one very close-knit, trusted group of people that are trying to attack the network um, up front. And to prevent against these kinds of adversaries, all you can really do is make sure that that adversary doesn't make up a large portion of the network. And so this, this is true of, um, of pretty much every blockchain where you need 51% uh, of the mining power to be honest in order to make sure that um, the security of the blockchain holds. Uh, in Republic Protocol, we decide to set the threshold for Shamir secrets at two-thirds. So unless you have two-thirds of a pool, it's impossible to actually reconstruct the order at all. And if you have two-thirds less one, you have just as much information as if you only had one. So against the non-adaptive adversary, these uh, REN bonds uh, prevent someone who is financially bound uh, from attacking the network at scale. And acquiring that much REN in order to attack the network in that way would be quite expensive. For the adaptive adversary, this is one where you sort of say, oh, look, it uh, has become apparent that all of us are in the same pool together. Why don't we decide to collude and uh, we'll share fragments with each other, discover the orders, and take advantage of that uh, in the market. The incentive that stops you doing this is that the trader and the nodes, when they exchange fragments, they enter an agreement by signing 
the hash of the fragment. And if anyone at any point can reveal the actual fragment that hashes to this hash, they gain a reward by slashing the bond of the node that was in charge of this fragment. And so in the adaptive adversary case, it's very unlikely that we are highly trusting each other or that we were already working together. And so there's nothing stopping us sharing the fragments with each other, manipulating the market or getting insight into the market and taking advantage of it there, and then also taking our fragments and attacking each other by extracting our bonds. And so you provide an economic incentive not to reveal fragments by saying that if the fragment is ever revealed, you will lose your bond. As, as a, a, an actor wishing to manipulate the market or get inside information, so what prevents me from simply extracting certain information about the, about the fragment that wouldn't allow me to sort of reconstruct that fragment? Not, so like not, not publishing the fragment itself, but only publishing some amount of information about the fragment that on its own wouldn't allow a third party to look at that frag look at that information, reconstruct the fragment itself, and then extract the bonds. So you can show that unless you actually have the the fragments in full, that you don't get any kind of information. So you can uh, verify mathematically that unless you do have two thirds of the fragments proper, there's no way to extract any information from it. Having some information about some of the fragments gives you absolutely nothing at all. Okay, so I would need to have two thirds of the fragments in order to extract any sort of information. And this is because of the way that these fragments are constructed in the Shamir secret sharing uh, scheme. Yes, that's right. Okay, interesting. Do you know of any other blockchain systems that are using this uh, Shamir uh, secret sh sharing scheme? It's kind of a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, um, there are two that I'm aware of. There's Keeper and um, Enigma. So Keeper is focused on secret keeping uh, and having secret information on the blockchain. Uh, specifically, they focus on, on keys and providing signatures. Uh, and Enigma is attempting to provide arbitrary uh, computations using um, secret sharing. Uh, where that differs from what we're doing is that we acknowledge that we've got a very specific focus with our uh, computations. We're not trying to do arbitrary computations. We're just trying to do an auto matching computation, which at the end of the day is quite simple. You take two numbers, you subtract one from the other, and you check whether it's greater than zero. This is far from being arbitrary, but it means that we can create a lot of optimization uh, that allow us to do this orders of magnitude faster than current industry standards. And how, how does this um, secret sharing method relate to zero knowledge proofs and ZKP circuits? Are, there, are they similar? Um, there's some similarity in the sense that they provide a level of zero knowledge and you can verify the computations are completely correct. And so you can know some information about some inputs without knowing anything about the inputs, but they're not based on the same uh, principles. And do you use ZKPs uh, and ZKP circuits in any way? We use very small, very efficient zero knowledge proofs when it comes time to challenging an opponent to check whether or not they've done a computation faithfully. Uh, but no, other than that, we don't usually touch them. Or we don't touch them at all. Um, and they're not zero knowledge proofs in the way that um, they're traditionally seen in the rest of crypto. OK. So let's, let's talk about the atomic swap part. So we, we, we've covered um, posting the orders, how the orders are matched, the incentive models. Uh, but then when it comes down to it, I mean, you really want your trade to be executed. And that uh, happens through an atomic swap. I, I, I mean, we, we have talked about atomic swaps in the past um, to some extent, but we haven't really gone into detail about how they work. Uh, I, don't, I don't think anyway. I don't recall having. Uh, uh, but could you uh, describe then how an atomic swap, swap works uh, and um, how it pertains to the uh, Republic Protocol? Sure. So they're based on a thing called uh, hash time lock contracts, uh, which is a fancy way of saying that I'm going to put my ether up in a contract and I'm going to send it to you, but only if you can reveal the pre-image of a particular hash. Uh, and we'll call that hash the lock. Right, so I have some hash and if you can reveal the thing that becomes that hash, then you can extract the money. And I have this secret. Then you take the same lock and you send me money on the condition that I can reveal the pre-image. Now I have the pre-image, which means once you've set that up, I can go and 
submit that to your blockchain and extract the funds that you wanted to send me. But the point of the blockchain is that it's all public information. So as soon as I do that, I've revealed my pre-image. And you can now take that and submit that and get my Ethereum. And where the time aspect of it comes in is just uh, a way of getting refunded if either participant decides to stop that process and just not participate. And so currently, uh, or at least when you launch, uh, the Republic Protocol will support Bitcoin and Ether and ERC-20 tokens. Um, can you talk about what, what makes it possible today for those, those pairs to work and um, uh, why are we limited to these three pairs? Is it, is it, is it uh, sort of more technical on your side or uh, does, it, does it have to do with compatibility with other blockchains? Yeah, so um, uh, I'll just jump in here. Um, the, the primary reason we're looking at these three pairs is not necessarily because of technical limitations. Uh, the primary reason is that um, we want asset pairs that are traded heavily. So, so there's no point picking, um, I guess, two tokens or you know, different chains that support these tokens. Um, there's no point using them, uh, choosing them to be supported in our protocol if they have no liquidity. Um, so I mean, the whole purpose of Republic Protocol is for large trades. For small trades, it makes no sense to trade uh, on our protocol. Um, it's actually more efficient to trade on the public markets. So I mean, with it's just uh, it's very evident that um, BTC, ERC twenty tokens, and ETH are traded uh, very heavily, uh, along with the tether pair for many exchanges. So I think those are the things that we look to support initially. Um, as for other chains, I, I mean, there are I do know that Zcash, for example, has um, hash time like contracts built in, Litecoin, Vertcoin, Decred. I mean, I mean, these are all chains that do support. Um, such trades, but we really look to focus on a few initially to bootstrap liquidity. So how common are atomic swaps at the moment? I mean, do, do, do a lot of trades happen on say, for instance, like Bitcoin Ether through atomic swaps? Not really. Um, they're a fairly new com concept. I think uh, really popularized last year. Um, I think Charlie Lee did the, did the swap with, uh, from Litecoin to Decred. And, and that really kicked off a whole wave of media. But so far, people haven't really sort of executed it in a way that um, is massively used. So just to stay on this topic, uh, what, what is, so you, the only real requirement is that the blockchain supports these, uh, these lock time contracts. As you mentioned, uh, Litecoin supports it, uh, Bitcoin, Ether, what what is what is what does it look like in terms of ecosystem adoption uh, for lock time contracts and just just being able to do atomic swaps between any blockchain? Well, I, I think that it's for adoption. It's less about having the technology there, but making it usable. Um, similarly to our for, for our system, we you know we have a lot of complex moving pieces, but to the user, it's it's very simple. Um, they can interact through with it through an interface. So it's the same thing for atomic swaps. Um, there just hasn't been a lot of this sort of auxiliary UI and UX built for them yet to make them feasible um, for the general public. And there are quite a few people work, uh, working on this. So, Yeah, because I suppose you also need not only uh, the, the sort of user interface aspect, but you would also presumably need some sort of price discovery mechanism and like a way to match uh, buyers and sellers in a trade. Yeah. So, so an interesting one that I have seen is um, some larger OTC desks working on atomic swaps for their clients. So I, I, that's quite an interesting one. I, I think that um, it, it's a very applicable use case, but such things won't be sort of popularized by the media, which is why we don't hear about them. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a very interesting technology that can be used in many different places. And it, it's just a matter of time before um, we, we see it popping up around the place in many different forms. What are your thoughts on how atomic swaps might affect uh, the, the exchange business model uh, in the future? So centralized exchanges? I think centralized exchanges um, ha have many sort of uh, efficiencies compared to decentralized exchanges uh, and atomic swaps. So, I mean, I think the, the, um, the fact that all the order books are sort of centralized and auto matching can happen in a centralized way 
And, and when you deposit money into an exchange, it becomes a number in a database that can be freely traded. Um, I, I think that these are things that uh, that atomic uh, that centralized exchanges will have over decentralized exchanges and atomic swaps for a long time. So, so I, I see it being, um, uh, yeah, uh, less less of a harsh impact. Uh, I'm not going to take the 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 view that one is necessarily better than the other at a particular time. I see. And regard regarding Republic Protocol, then I mean, it, you know, being a, a decentralized uh, dark pool, um, couldn't you also deploy a similar network that doesn't have all of the privacy and just have it be like a, a, a an open public decentralized exchange? Have you thought about that? Um, yeah, we, we have thought about that as well. I think that the dark pool is um, suited for a few reasons. And, and one of the reasons is that while blockchain scale, um, we're still able to capture this market because um, people who are trading you know, millions at a time uh, perhaps are not so concerned about the split second change. Um, of course, there will be people who are concerned, but um, it's not a necessary requirement for a lot of these traders. So, for example, if I call up an OTC desk, maybe they take, you know, a, 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 at a minimum one day to you know, fully, fully execute my trade. And I think that for, for us, you know, the, the maximum time lock for a, for an atomic swap contract is 24 hours anyway. Um, so I think that speed thing, speed limitations are less um, worrying for us. Um, of course, if we do want to, uh, so in the future, we want to support um, sort of second layer scaling solutions so we can bring on these high frequency traders. But um, in the short term, it, it's, um, it's better that we tackle this problem first compared to making it a public uh, sort of public decentralized exchange, so to speak. Now, in your, I believe it's in your white paper where you mentioned that uh, the Republic Protocol could be, uh, could also run on other blockchains. So, for instance, um, you know, could run on on EOS or could run on another blockchain like Tezos, presumably, uh, or any any platform that supports smart contracts. Um, is this something? So, why why? Is this something that you're looking to do at some point in the future? Why would you choose to deploy it on other smart contract platforms? Um, so I think that um, with regards to that, we're, we're really talking about the, the REN token and the REN ecosystem. So really, uh, REN tokens uh, interact with the Ethereum blockchain uh, at a minimal capacity. So as long mentioned before, we, we use them to register traders, we use them to register nodes, um, and, and pretty much the the advantage for registering a node um, is that you can start earning order fees in, in the in the ecosystem. But coming back to the point on um, why we would not deploy on another chain um, with these set of contracts, um, th there is no reason why. I think that Ethereum is just the most stable ecosystem that we've seen so far. So speaking of this of this ecosystem, I'd like to come back to one topic that uh, I just occurred to me. We we failed to to discuss uh, during the, the, the show, and, and that is the uh, the amount uh, posted by the bonders or by the uh, by the network participants. What defines this amount? And what's, is, is there is there like a, a, an algorithm that defines how much one would have to bond in order to secure the network? Yeah, for, for registering a, a, a dark node to enable you to match orders, um, the, the current sort of preliminary number is um, 100,000 REN tokens. So, so the reason we picked this is because um, there there are a total of uh, one billion rent tokens in uh, for for the supply, um, and, and if we choose a number like a hundred thousand per node, that means that there can be an absolute maximum of ten thousand nodes in the system, um, which it, which is sort of a billion divided by a hundred thousand. So I think that um, the reason we pick such a number is that uh, the more nodes that we have in the system, the the slower it becomes. But the more nodes that we have in the system, the more secure it is. So it's always a trade-off between security and speed, uh, and also the sort of the profitability for that particular node to earn fees. Um, so, so this is the reason we've picked such a number. So before we wrap up, uh, I'd like to talk about um, both the company that you're building, and so you recently uh, completed an ICO. Can you talk about uh, about your ICO? Uh, how much did you raise, and uh, who were your investors? Yeah, so we finished our public ICO on the 2nd of February. So we raised 5,000 in the public ICO and 30,000 in the private presale. 
um, some of two, two of our lead investors um, for the round were FBG and Polychain, um, and, and also Signum Capital and Hyperchain have been very helpful to us in Singapore. So yeah, that, that was the race. So the company is based in Singapore? Yeah, the company is based in Singapore. And you have operations also in Australia? So our de development team is spread across Singapore and Australia. Okay, and any particular reason why you chose Singapore as a, as a place to launch this company? I think Singapore has a very vibrant ecosystem when it comes to uh, the sort of cryptocurrency community, um, whereas uh, sp spaces like Australia are still sort of getting the hang of it and, and the ecosystem is developing there. Um, it's at a much earlier stage. So I think the, the number of connections that we can have in Singapore to projects, to, to founders, to funds is is much greater so this is the reason we pick singapore i would definitely agree i mean i've been i'm actually in singapore at the moment um and uh i've been here for about a week i uh, uh our listeners might recall a few weeks ago we did an episode with anson zeal uh, uh who uh, is part of access the sort of cryptocurrency uh startups association in singapore and you know we were talking about the ecosystem and and the fact that it's it's it's, it's actually quite an active ecosystem. There's a lot of startups here. And I was, you know, we actually, we met, uh, you and I uh, at the decentralized Singapore conference, which was, uh, just last week. And there's, there's, I mean, I was quite surprised to see, uh, so many companies here. Uh, and I mean, you know, sort of in, in the, in the West and like Europe and, and, and the U S we don't necessarily, um, get to experience what's happening in this part of the world. But, uh, one thing that was quite clear to me is that uh, there are quite a few companies here doing a lot of interesting things. Uh, and so I was uh, very, very pleased to, to, to be able to take part in that and, and sort of witness, witness that firsthand. Yeah, it's great. I, I think that unlike other areas, um, if you want to visit a, a, a company here, it's just a walk away. So yeah, I know it, it definitely feels like the ecosystem is quite tight knit. And even with other uh, Asian countries and sort of Southeast Asia, I mean, at the conference, there were people from uh, from China, from uh, from uh, from Thai, from Thailand, uh, from Korea, we had you know, a lot of uh, uh, delegates from India as well. So uh, it, it it does it does kind of I mean it, 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 for for I mean it was my first time in Asia uh, actually visiting Asia. So um, it it, it kind of sort of felt like 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 Europe in in a, in a sense uh, where every every country sort of just a skip and a hop away and like a cheap flight away. Uh, and so you have this very tight knit ecosystem and uh, Singapore seems to be a place where all that is kind of codifying. Yeah, definitely agreed. Yeah. So those who are interested in, in uh, sort of seeing the talks uh, from, uh, from that conference, uh, Decentralize uh, Singapore, uh, the website is Decentralize uh, with a Z dot SG. And I believe the talks will be online uh, in the coming days. So just about when this comes out, you know, uh, the talks will be made available online. So definitely check out uh, the website, and uh, I'll, I'll we'll put some links in the show notes uh, to where you can find those videos. Um, so in terms of roadmap, uh, tell us uh, when will the Republic Protocol launch publicly? So we're we're looking at testnet very soon, so within this quarter, uh, and the public mainnet release will be um, in, in the third quarter, so r roughly around July. And so if uh, one is interested in becoming a node on the network uh, or participating in the project in, in some capacity, how can one do that? So one can just follow our Medium blog. Uh, we post updates there uh, semi-often and we will have, be having an update about, um, I guess, the, the criteria for running a node and how you can get in touch and uh, start, start running those. Great, terrific. Uh, well, guys, thanks so much for uh, for being on the show today. It was a pleasure having you, and it was a pleasure meeting you here in Singapore. Yeah, thanks, Ed. You too. Yeah, thanks. It was enjoyable. And thanks to our listeners for once again tuning in. You can find new episodes of Epicenter uh, on iTunes, SoundCloud, uh, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get the video version on YouTube. And of course, we release new episodes every week. Uh, and if you're interested in supporting the show, uh, you can obviously leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show. And we're also very grateful at seeing your reviews. And uh, you can join our community. We're on Gitter at epicenter.tv slash Gitter. Uh, so thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.